So two important types of cells found in our body are epidermal cells and epithelial cells. Epidermal cells are found on the largest organ of our body, the skin, and epithelial cells are basically found covering the inside portion of different organs and different structures of our body. Now, anytime either one of these two cell types is damaged in some way, for instance, I make some type of cut in my skin so that the epidermal cells are damaged, what happens is a molecule known as epidermal growth factor is released and this molecule is a peptide molecule. It's a protein that acts as a primary messenger in the EGF signal transduction pathway where EGF stands for epidermal growth factor. So this is the signal transduction pathway that we're going to focus on in this lecture. So we see that this pathway stimulates the growth and division. So processes like cell proliferation, cell division, cell growth, cell differentiation of these epidermal and epithelial cells. So let's begin by focusing on the actual structure of that protein receptor that binds the EGF molecules. And this is basically what it looks like here. So we have the cell membrane, the outside and the inside of the cell. Now in its unbound state, before the EGF molecules bind onto this receptor, we see that the EGF receptor actually consists of two identical but separated monomeric units. So this is monomer number one and this is monomer number two and these two monomers are not attached by any type of bond so they're actually separated and as we'll see in just a moment they actually dimerize they form a dimer only upon the binding of the EGF molecule. Now let's examine each one of these individual monomers. So we have this purple region found on the extracellular side and this is the region that contains a binding site for that EGF molecule. This brown section is that section that essentially uh, spans the membrane and it anchors that molecule in that membrane. And this is the intracellular domain region found on the inside portion of the cell. And this is the region that contains the tyrosine protein kinase domain that will be responsible for initiating the first phosphorylation process as we'll see in just a moment. Now this is the C tail, the carboxyl terminal end of this polypeptide and we'll see why that's important in just a moment. So we basically have these two identical monomers in their unbound form. They're separated because the EGF is not bound to this structure. But let's see what happens upon the binding of EGF and notice that unlike the insulin case, where a single insulin binds to the insulin receptor. In this case, two EGF molecules actually bind to this EGF re uh, receptor. One binds on this side and the other binds on this opposing side. Now, upon, a upon the binding of these two EGF molecules onto these extracellular domains, what happens is, there is a section on this side and this side of these two domains that we call the dimerization arm. And upon the binding, each one of these dimerization arms basically stretches out and reaches out into a pocket found on the opposing domain. So this arm stretches and binds here and this arm stretches and binds here. Because upon the binding of the EGF, there is a conformational change that takes place that allows these two intersurfaces to basically interact with one another. And this is the process we call dimerization. It produces a dimer, whereas before we had these two individual separated monomers, now these two monomers basically come together to form a dimer structure. So when a total of two EGF signal molecules, the primary messengers, bind onto the extracellular region, they induce the dimerization arm of one monomer to stretch out and reach into the pocket of that second monomer, which leads to the formation of that dimer structure. 
And this is what we basically show here. Upon the binding, these reach out to interact and form this dimer structure. And these also slightly change in conformation and they also interact with one another. So let's now focus on what happens here. So the conformational changes here lead to conformational changes here. And so what happens here is this C-terminal tail that we mentioned just a moment ago basically moves into the active side of that corresponding, of that opposing uh, unit. So this C-tail basically moves into the active side of this one and this C-tail moves into the active side of this one. And once they move in, what that active side does is it phosphorylates the tyrosine residues and it phosphorylates up to five residues found on this C-terminal tail. In this case, I've only shown four. So again, when we form the dimer, when this conformational change takes place, the carboxylic, the C-terminal end of one tyrosine kinase domain moves into the active side of the opposing tyrosine kinase domain. And this is what we call the cross phosphorylation process. So in the same way that in the insulin pathway we carried out cross phosphorylation, here we also carry out cross phosphorylation, except in this particular case, it's not the activation side, but it's the C-terminal tail that moves into the active side of that opposing tyrosine kinase domain. So basically, in this step, we conclude the following. The binding of the EGF molecules onto these binding sites basically causes this dimerization process to actually take place. And what that leads to is the cross phosphorylation of these C terminal tails on both of these sides. And what, the, what this cross phosphorylation process actually does is it creates attachment points for further attachment of other proteins, as we'll see in just a moment. So the entire point of phosphorylating these two regions is to basically allow the attachment of other important proteins that are part of the EGF signal transduction pathway. And to see what we mean by that, let's take a look at the following diagram. So we can see that there are many different types of proteins and enzymes involved in this process. And so I've labeled one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So let's basically see what each one of these steps actually involves. And let's begin with step number one. So once we phosphorylate this section, what happens is an important protein basically known as GRB2 actually binds onto a phosphoryl group. So a, a uh, phosphorylated uh, tyrosine residue found on this section here. So this serves as an attachment point for this GRB2, where by the way, GRB stands for growth factor receptor bound protein 2. And so this one shown in brown binds onto this section and this protein acts as an adapter protein. So this molecule itself doesn't actually activate anything, but rather what it does is it acts as an anchoring point. It allows the attachment of an important protein shown in two that is known as the SOS protein. So in one, we have the phosphorylated region of the EGF receptor. This section here acts as an anchor for an adapter protein we call GRB2. Next, what this GRB2 does is it, is it allows the attachment of the SOS protein. So GRB2 recruits another protein called SOS shown in dark purple. And what the SOS does is it contains an active side that basically binds this green structure we call RAS. And RAS is basically a small G protein. It basically allows the binding of GDP molecules and GTP molecules. And just like the G proteins we spoke of in the previous lectures, this small G protein in its inactive state binds GDP and in its active state it binds GTP. And so what happens is one, once two, the SOS, 
binds onto one, the GRB2 that activates this protein called SOS, shown in purple, that allows it to bind this RAS. Now, RAS is a small G protein, and once this binding takes place, it essentially constricts this space. It allows uh, this molecule to expel the GT, uh, uh, GDP, guanosine diphosphate, and instead it binds a GTP, guanosine triphosphate, and that activates this RAS protein. So in step three, we have the SOS then binds RAS, a small g protein. This activates RAS by expelling a GDP and binding instead a GTP. Now, this RAS is actually attached into the membrane, and that's because the RAS protein contains a covalently modified amino acid that contains a lipid attachment, and that lipid attachment remains inside the membrane. Now, once the RAS is in its inactive form, it goes on to activate another membrane-bound protein known as RAF. And just like this structure contains the covalently modified lipid, this structure also contains a covalently modified lipid component that is found within the membrane. So both of these are essentially attached into the membrane. So in five, we or here we see activator RAS moves on to activate a protein kinase called a RAF. So this is a protein kinase. And once this is activated, it goes on and activates other molecules via the process of phosphorylation. And what it activates are molecules known as MECs or simply MEC. So activator RAF then goes on to activate protein kinases called MEC. So what exactly does MEC actually stand for? Well, it stands for mitogen activated protein kinases. And we have many different types. So what these activated MECs do is they go on to activate further protein kinases. So they, they go on to activate uh, further processes, namely they go on to activate kinases we call ERCs or ERC. Now ERC stands for extracellular signal regulated kinases. And once we activate the ERCs, these ERCs basically move on into the nucleus of our cell. And in the nucleus, these ERCs ultimately stimulate transcription factors to basically bind onto specific genes and express proteins. And the more proteins we're able to express, the quicker our cells can actually grow. Because remember, for the cell to actually grow and increase in size and ultimately divide, we have to basically grow proteins. We have to build proteins because the organelles and all the different components inside our cells are essentially formed from proteins. In fact, the entire cytoskeleton is formed from proteins. So we see in this final step, activated ERCs move into the nucleus and stimulate transcription factors to increase gene expression. This increases the rate of protein production, which enlarges the cytoskeleton and leads to cell growth and ultimately might lead to cell division to basically produce many more of these cells that were damaged as a result of, let's say, that particular cut that we experienced on our skin. So this is what we call the EGF signal transduction pathway. It is basically used to allow the growth and division of either epidermal cells or the epithelial cells of our body. And notice that in this particular case, just like, uh, just like in the insulin case, this receptor actually contained a tyrosine protein kinase domain. And this a uh, particular pathway, just like the epinephrine pathway, also used a specific type of molecule that is stimulated as a result of the binding of GTP. And these are known as G proteins. And in this case, this is known as a small G protein. Now, the final question is, once this pathway takes place and accomplishes what it actually wanted to accomplish, so those cells divide and grow, how exactly does our body basically shut off this pathway? Because if the body isn't able to shut off the pathway, that can lead to many different types of negative effects, for instance, cancer cells.
And so there are two ways by which our body actually deactivates this process. Number one is because this process actually involves many kinases. So this is a kinase, these are kinases, these are kinases. Our body basically can reverse the effects of these kinases by using phosphatases. And so phosphatases are used by the body to basically remove those phosphoryl groups that were attached by these kinases. And that's the first way by which our body can shut off this process. The second way is to actually turn off this green molecule, the RAS protein. So just like in the case of our insulin, uh, not, not insulin, the epinephrine signaling pathway where epinephrine basically used or that pathway used G proteins and the G proteins had the ability to turn off their own activity. In this case, this small G protein, the RAS, also contains GTPase activity. So it basically has a built-in clock that allows it to turn off itself after some time has passed. And so that's the second method by which this pathway can actually be turned off by the cells of our body.